For translation, English is uh, channel 2 and channel 7 for Africa. So we welcome everybody here this afternoon to this side event um, entitled Obstacles to Implementing Counterterrorism Measures in Yemen. As an introduction, um, is the observation is that terrorism in Yemen is at the same time an old and new phenomenon. Old in that when Arab jihadists returned from Afghanistan in 1990 and were integrated in the Yemeni armed forces, they participated in the war of 1994 against the South. New phenomenon in that the post-1994 war period witnessed the collapse in the country's social, political, and security fabric. And together, together with other geopolitical upheavals in the Middle East, namely the rise and fall of the ISIS caliphate in Syria and Iraq, and presence of Al-Qaeda, which have made Yemen a fertile ground, a neutral, natural safe haven for the establishment and entrenchment of terrorist activities. Today, the two draft resolutions under item 2 and 10 under discussion among members of the Council for adoption have failed in tackling the issue of terrorism, at least in accordance with the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy, which called upon member states, international, regional and sub-regional organizations and other relevant actors to step up their efforts in its implementation. Member states in the region were equally called upon to deny terrorist groups safe havens, access to financial, logistical or political support, freedom of movement, operation and recruitment of forces, and where appropriate, extradite those found to be perpetrators of terrorist acts or supporting, facilitating, participating in or planning acts of terrorism. The panelists that we've gathered here in this debate will highlight the root causes of terrorism in Yemen and present those obstacles which to date continue to preclude implementation of counterterrorism measures in spite of the UN global counterterrorism strategy, the regional and international community's highest form of response. In the discussions and exchange of views to be generated, it is hoped to picture may perhaps be developed to expose and understand exactly the nature of the key obstacles and as a result determine concrete solutions and way forward to successfully accomplishing the goals of the United Nations Global Terrorism Strategy for Yemen. Now, to lead the debate, we have our speakers. We have, on my left, we have Dr. Elizabeth Kendall, and Dr. Kendall is a senior research fellow in Arabic and Islamic S studies at the Oxford University Pembroke College in the United Kingdom. And on my right, um, Dr. Kendall, excuse me, also works on connections between militant jihadists, political movements, and cultural production in Arabic, specifically in contemporary <coughs> Egypt and Yemen. Dr. Kendall is also an Associate Fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence based in the Department of War Studies at King's College in London. And on my right we have um, Mr. Salah bin Al-Akbar. He's a journalist with over 15 years on the ground experience in Yemen. He's an expert in terrorism and writer, researcher and lecturer at the University of Aden. He's also advisor and correspondent on Yemen for Sky News Arabia. And he's finally, he's a general supervisor of the Sunny Future TV channel. So we welcome you both. Um, what we will do, we will have a presentation from Dr. Kendall and also from Ms. Bin al after which we will invite questions from you, the audience, participants. So Dr. Kendall, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sheila, and uh, also Saeed Mukbil and, uh, and Aisha Puneo for your fantastic organisation. I'm extremely pleased to be here and have the opportunity 
to talk about this very serious problem in Yemen and why it continues to persist despite the best efforts of the United Arab Emirates and its associated forces in the South to put an end to the terrorism problem. So I'm going to spend 10 minutes looking at where this problem has come from since the start of the war in 2015, and then another 10 minutes looking at where we are now and what the challenges are right now. I always start with a map so that we can see what we're talking about. But ever since the 1980s, there's been a terrorist problem in Yemen. And there are lots of reasons for that. Not least, the topography of Yemen is conducive to hide terrorists and their training camps. Corruption has been rampant for decades. We have persistent conflict. And of course, the political machinations of different parties using terrorist groups to further their political agendas. It's not all about ideology, it's also about politics. Since 2017, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State in Yemen have been greatly reduced in their capacity to operate thanks to counter-terrorism measures. But nonetheless, despite the drone strikes, despite special forces operations, and despite the internal disputes inside the groups themselves and between Al-Qaeda and Islamic State fighting each other, the problem is still there. And I think we need to look at why it became so entrenched when the war began in 2014 or 2015 when the international side of the war began. So, I tried in one of my many trips to Yemen since 2015 to find out what has really been driving these jihad groups. And I think it's helpful to look at some survey work I did prior to the war when I decided to go and ask what motivates communities in the east of Yemen, which was where Al-Qaeda really managed to entrench. If you just look at the map for one second, the shaded areas, the stripy bits on the map, show the area that Al-Qaeda in, in the Arabian Peninsula had influence. It didn't exactly run a state in all of that area, but it had influence. How did it get that influence? Well, we tend to ask the wrong question in the West. We are always asking the question, how are people radicalized? The question we should be asking is a different one. We should be asking, why are populations tolerating Al-Qaeda? And if you think about Yemen, you can't terrorize Yemenis into submission. Pretty much everyone in the eastern areas has a gun, and they're quite used to fighting and to dying. So you can't terrorize populations into submission. There must be something else going on. So, this slide here, this shows us the extraordinary links now between organized crime and terrorism, which are rampant since this war began. And this is because different political groups have been getting into bed with Al-Qaeda to utilize them for their political agendas. When I said that there must be something else driving the jihad, well, part of it is money. Part of it is control of these smuggling routes. These are in the east of Yemen. The weapons get dropped not only to Al-Qaeda, who helps run the networks, but also to the Houthis. So it's business. It's business, not ideology. 
But one other element, let me just check to see if I've got a slide that shows this. Okay, we don't have one here. One other element is that when I asked populations in the East, what is it that you actually want for your future? You know, only 21% answered that they wanted an imam to intervene. They wanted their religious leaders to intervene in all areas of life. Just 21%. So there's no appetite for religious rule. And only 10% wanted a single strong leader. So there must have been something else going on. And when I analysed Al-Qaeda's Twitter feed, its governance Twitter feed, during the time it was in power in Mukalla in 2015 to 2016, I found an amazing result. 56% of all of its tweets were about community development projects. What that tells us is that Al-Qaeda was trying to get on side with local communities by stepping in where corrupt governments were failing. The government was failing to address community needs. They needed security, they needed hospitals, schools, education, and Al-Qaeda was trying to help communities achieve that and therefore win toleration and support. When I went to interview leaders in Mukalla, community leaders, in late 2015, at the height of the Al-Qaeda state, they talked to me about how awful life was under Al-Qaeda rule, it was personally restrictive, they didn't like it, and the conversation went on long into the night. I suggested that we should continue our conversation the next day and talk about it in more detail. And they said, oh no, doctora, we can't do that because we have a meeting with Al-Qaeda tomorrow. And I thought, wow, that's quite a contradiction. Why is that? You've just been moaning to me about Al-Qaeda. You've been complaining for the last three hours, and now you're telling me you're meeting them. And they said, well, yes, actually, uh, I have a water problem in my village, and Al-Qaeda is going to sort it out. The other one had a land problem in his family. Oh, they're going to help me figure it out after years of neglect by the government. And the third one owned a cement factory. And he said, business has never been better. They're building schools and roads. So this shows you the very interesting balance. When we in the West look at our news feeds, our newspapers, and we listen to security organizations and think tanks, they always focus in on Al-Qaeda chopped off someone's hand or uh, Al-Qaeda stoned someone to death for adultery. And we imagine that that's all they're doing. And so our response to them is calibrated as though it's to counter an organization that is only violent. But there's so much more. And if we miss what's driving the toleration for these groups, the local concerns, the local grievances, the marginalization, the neglect, the corruption in government, if we miss all of that, then we're never going to counter them successfully. So this cannot be countered just by violence. It needs good organization, transparent politics, and uncorrupt politicians and leaders. This is the long-term way to counter Al-Qaeda. Notice that whenever Al-Qaeda did do uh, one of the hudud punishments of Islamic law, like chopping off someone's hand for theft or stoning someone to death for sorcery or adultery, they made it look like they were a state. Very different from Daesh. Al-Qaeda always had a cordoned off, big arena. You, you were not allowed to take close-up photographs. And they always had an ambulance or a police car in the frame. And what that meant is it looked like a state. It looked like it was in control. It looked like they were the good guys, as opposed to Daesh, who were the thugs and the 
the gangs and the people who corrupted Islam. Al-Qaeda was showing we can do security, the government can't. Only 3% of Al-Qaeda's tweets were about the hudud punishments, the, the corporal punishments of Islamic law. Just 3%. And notice also that 13% of all of their tweets were about maharajanas, parties, celebrations. So while the west of Yemen was being bombed by coalition aircraft, the east of Yemen in Mukalla was celebrating. They were having a good time. They had lots of maharajanas. Uh, one of the most famous ones was the three-day festival called Jerusalem We're Coming, where Kids were enlisted. They had a strong youth outreach program. Children were blindfolded and made to try and feed each other ice cream. This was fun. There were competitions to memorize, this is our mission, Al-Qaeda, this is our mission. If kids memorized it and wrote a summary of it, well, they could win a Kalashnikov, a computer, money. They had a very strong youth outreach program, and there was even a competition in schools amongst schoolboys in Mukalla to design a poster that was anti-drone and anti-America. al amriki kullana didhu, you know, we're all against Americans. Uh, these were the winning posters amongst the young generation. So think about that. This is going to be a long battle. Children have become involved. They even have an outreach truck, which they drive around the battlefronts in Ta'iz now, uh, which is all about handing out uh, lectures, anashid, anthems, uh, some poetry, etc. So they have a way into people's minds. One of the things that's also missed is the way in which Al-Qaeda communicated. It wasn't just violence. There was the thing that I study most, which is poetry. About one in five pages of Al-Qaeda's main magazine contained poetry. This is over a four-year period. Now, the poetry isn't just there as a space filler. And I'm sure some of you will be thinking, why is this woman talking about poetry now? But it's because it's a great example of how Al-Qaeda tunes in to local traditions and local cultures and then uses them to spread its ideology, especially in the east of Yemen where illiteracy rates are high, in desert areas where there's very little internet. And it's just something that people do every day in their lives. Meanwhile, counterterrorism measures, and my country is one of those at the forefront of this, we do leaflet drops where we tell people, don't do this, do this. This is not the way to address local populations and get them on side. It needs to be a much more subtle and much more in tune with existing cultural traditions. Now, what about what's happening right now? Okay, the United Arab Emirates and its related southern forces and its assistance from Western Special Forces did a very good job of stopping the Al-Qaeda state, its Imara, which was run out of Mukalla in April 2016. But even the following year, in 2017, it didn't have a state but Al-Qaeda still managed to launch over 270 operations inside Yemen, mostly small-scale and all domestic. So it was still there, but it didn't have territory. It wasn't ruling. But the problem hadn't gone away. One of the reasons for that was this, organized crime. It had made smuggling routes together with local tribes, power brokers. People are getting rich on the war. And if you think about it, even those inside the Sharia, the legitimate government of Yemen, even they have little incentive to end the war 
and end the war economy. Because when you've lived outside of Yemen for the last four and a bit years, when you, as President Herdy was, was the only candidate in an election, when his term came to an end in February 2014 and he was renewed by the international community, really, and not by the Yemeni people, how are you ever going to be accepted back in your country? You have no reason to end the war. And a lot of people getting rich on the economy that the war has generated. This fuels terrorism. I'm not saying that there are direct links, but I'm saying that there are links. There are links that are related to money, to power, to survival. The second thing that's happening now is the fragmentation of the jihad. Counterterrorism measures have prevented Al Qaeda from running a state, but as a result, the jihad has fragmented. There are lots of little groups. And although we hear mostly from the core groups, which are in Al Baida, that doesn't mean that there aren't other groups around. There's one that I found recently called uh, Ansar Ma'rib al Muwahideen. They exist outside Al Baida. There's also other groups in Abyan. There's, of course, Islamic State in Al Baida, the core group of Islamic State. There's another one that's now operating around Aden Abyan. And we must ask ourselves are these all genuinely terrorist groups? Or has the fragmentation of the jihad made it easier for political? parties and organizations to harness the groups and to use them to further their own aims, whether that is to sow discontent, especially in the South, to create tensions, to prevent peace, to try to pin the blame for political assassinations on terrorists. There are many potential ways of exploiting jihad. So, I undertook several interviews inside different military checkpoints in the east of Yemen alongside the smuggling routes that were used. And I learned a lot about how the political groups and the terrorist groups were collaborating together. Probably too much detail for a presentation like this, and I'm conscious of time, but I, I want people to bear that in mind. The face value of what terrorists are doing are not always what they look. One example of that would be when the Southern Transition Council asserted its authority in the south of Yemen in August this year, suddenly we saw a dramatic increase in the number of terrorist attacks around Aden Abyan. We had not seen any attacks from Islamic State in Aden Abyan since March 2018, so about 18 months we'd had nothing, and then suddenly here they were again. Likewise with Al-Qaeda, we've had a few attacks in Aden Abyan, but not many at all, mostly in al Baida. Suddenly, in August, we see the number shoot up around Aden Abyan. What this suggests, although I don't have hard evidence, is that the groups were being activated or utilised by external forces in order to destabilize the South. There's one final point that I would like to make, which is I think there's a new battleground now, not just amongst the children that I've just mentioned, but also potentially amongst women. 
And we are seeing a new approach by Al-Qaeda towards women. Al-Qaeda has in its videos used footage of women complaining about the security services being angry. And think about it. If you're a woman living in a war zone, you, you might be a widow, your husband might have been uh, abducted or killed, or your, hus- or your brother or, or your father. Women become empowered in conflict zones. This is normal. This happened in Europe during the First and the Second World Wars. Women took on more active roles. Now, this is an energy that terrorist groups can harness, and I think we're just seeing it begin. I've got one minute. (laughs) So don't mistake this for women's empowerment, however. This is not about gender equality on the part of al-Qaeda. This is the kind of thing that al-Qaeda in Syria has now started putting out, and I'm seeing it spread in Yemen from this particular group. This is the kind of element. It's women, stay indoors, don't get ideas above your station. It's not your role to be engaged in combat or politics. You should be supporting the jihad in the role of wife and mother. So you see this slide here, obeying my husband is part of obeying my lord. Don't get ideas about empowerment. And there's a new group that has come out of Syria. The bit I'm most interested in is the literature that comes out of it. And here we have what you might call jihadist chiclet, women's literature for for the wives and daughters and sisters of the Mujahideen. And, you know, these are the kinds of things... Uh, coming-of-age stories. So the first one on the left, you know, I fell in love with a mujahid. And they're role models, how you can support the jihad. This is just beginning to take off in Yemen. We need to be alert to it. This is one of the magazines that they've produced, Beituki, Your Home. Uh, and there's a problem page for women, you know, what do I do if my husband takes a second, third, fourth wife? Um, my husband's a mujahid, he's always busy fighting, I never see him. Uh, and the answers will always be, well, don't complain, you must support him. That's very male-oriented. One of the projects that I've been helping with in the east of Yemen is to launch, on the right here, you see a woman's magazine, Salt al-Mar'a al Mahriya, And this is a way of, also in a very conservative way, engaging women and harnessing their energies and trying to give them a voice, but a voice that works in a positive way. And so I I realise I need to end now, but I'd like to end with two things. First, it's so important that our responses to terrorism, our counter-terrorist measures must be local. They have to engage at a local level and build on what communities are already doing and magnify that. We cannot go in from the outside saying, right, you need to do this and you need to do that with massive projects, with huge funding. That just breeds corruption and it looks foreign. But of course, Big organisations like the UN don't like that because it's lots of bitty little projects and they like to put it under a huge umbrella. I just don't think that works very well on the ground. Uh, And the second thing is, all the key ingredients for terrorism to persist are still there in Yemen. We might not see the groups quite so visibly now, They've gone on the ground and they've put an internet and mobile ban on themselves because they've been droned so much, but they're still there. We have a fragmenting state, we have growing sectarianism, foreign proxies, over two million children out of school, 10 million people practically starving, and We also have a looming water crisis in Yemen. All the ingredients are there. And I think the most dangerous time could be if we have a peace deal. Because a peace deal 
will actually leave so many parts of the population disappointed, disillusioned. They'll feel excluded, left out, unrepresented. That I think that that could be the time that Al-Qaeda, and to a lesser extent Islamic State, latch on to those local concerns again and resurge. So the messages don't relax. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you indeed very much, um, Dr. Kendall. We'll quickly move over to uh, Mr. Salah bin Amba for his presentation. Thank you very much. طبعا انا ساتحدث هنا باعتباري شاهدا على الفتره والمرحله التي تحدثت عنها الدكتوره مرحله تنامي الارهاب واستخدام الارهاب والتنامي وتوليد وتفريق الحروب والفساد في اليمن من وجهه نظري ان الارهاب في اليمن استدعي او بدا من خلال بعض الشخصيات التي ارتبطت بشكل مباشر بجماعة الإخوان المسلمين خاصة في مصر يعني في ستينيات وسبعينيات في القرن الماضي نتحدث عن شخصيات أمثال عبد المجيد الزنداني أمثال اليدومي أمثال شخصيات معروفة كثيرة من ضمنها الآن مرشدين لجماعة الإخوان المسلمين في اليمن قبل طبعا قبل هذا قبل إنشاء حزب الإصلاح اليمني هؤلاء عادوا من مصر حتى أن مثلا عبد المجيد الزنداني قطع دراسته في في الصيدله في كليه الصيدله في جامعه القاهره ليعود بشكل مستعجل لليمن لتاسيس نواه الاخوان المسلمين. هذه المساله ساعد عليها ايضا الحرب التي حصلت في في افغانستان والاجتياح السوفيتي لافغانستان مع بدايه او مع نهايه السبعينيات حيث كانت هذه بيئه خصبه للجماعات الارهابيه مكنت هؤلاء الدعاه أمثال عبد المجيد الزنداني وكثيرين إلى جانبه لكن أنا أذكر الاسم الأبرز من تجنيد الكثيرين نتحدث عن الآلاف ذهبوا بهم إلى أفغانستان للمشاركة في الحرب ضد السوفيات بعد ذلك عندما انتهت الحرب هناك وجدت هذه المجاميع أو وجدت نفسها مجاميع كبيرة مسلحة مؤدلجة بشكل خطير جدا تريد أن تجاهد في اي مكان اخر. بدا توجيه هذه الجماعات الى اليمن الجنوبي. سمعنا تسجيل فيديو لاسامه بن لادن شخصيا يتحدث عن هذه عن هذا الامر بانه كان مشروعهم بعد تحرير افغانستان ما سماه تحرير افغانستان التوجه الى اليمن الجنوبي لتحريره من الشيوعيين كما قال. بدا بعد ذلك نقل مجموعات كبيره. من هذه الجماعات الإرهابية إلى اليمن أنشئت معسكرات لهم أتحدث مثلا على سبيل المثال وليس الحصر معسكر حطاب في محافظة أبين هذا كان يضم حوالي ثلاثة آلاف مقاتل من مصر والجزائر وعدة دول عربية أخرى جميعهم من العائدين من أفغانستان هؤلاء وصلوا تباعا من دعام 92 أيضا استخدم هؤلاء من اليمنيين بشكل خاص في تنفيذ اغتيالات طالت 151 كادر جنوبي من كوادر الحزب الاشتراكي اليمني على اعتبار انهم كفار شيوعيون شيوعيون. طبعا النظام انذاك في صنعاء دعم هذه الجماعات الارهابيه وكان المخطط والممول لهذه العمليات عمليات الاغتيالات تمهيدا لما حصل بعد ذلك عندما فشلت الوحده في في 1994 وشاركت الجماعات الإرهابية بثمانية آلاف مقاتل كانوا رأس الحربة في اجتياح الجنوب والتمركز فيه بعد ذلك حتى أنه النظام نفسه واجه مشكلة مع هؤلاء وأذكر هنا حادثة معينة مباشرة بعد أشهر من 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 حرب 94 حاول حزب الإصلاح توظيف العديد من هؤلاء من من المقاتلين العرب في سلك التربية والتعليم. وهذه النقطة شكلت تحول، حزب الإصلاح بموجب تقاسم المنتصرين على الجنوب للسلطة 
كان صاحب حقيبة عدة حقائب بينها وزارة التربية والتعليم استغلها بشكل كبير جدا في تنمية الإرهاب أنا وأنا كنت في الثانوية العامة جاءنا شخص يدعى أبو عبد الرحمن الجزائري شخص مشهور جزائري من المجاهدين العرب كان يحاضرنا يحاضرنا في المدرسة وكان يدرسنا في المدرسة وسمعنا منه أن من لم من لم يصلي يقتل فورا وسمعنا منه بداية طبعا الجنوب ما لم يكن في فكر متطرف بهذا الشكل كنا نسمع من هذا الشخص كان تخرج له المدرسة بشكل كامل كل المدارس يخرج الطلاب جميعا وأنا منهم للاستماع لهذا الشخص المتطرف جدا بعد أشهر صدرت أوامر يعني طلب دولي لتسليم هذا الشخص وعدة أشخاص آخرين للولايات المتحدة حصلت حرب في الضالع آنذاك استمرت يومين قتل فيها ثمانية عشر جندي لأنه رفض الخروج وكانت حرب طاحنة استمرت يومين وقتل فيها أيضا مدنيون هذا الشخص كان يعمل في وزارة التربية والتعليم ويقيم في مقر الأمن السياسي الذي يدير حزب الإصلاح آنذاك بعد الحرب وكان يأتي إلى المدارس برفقة قيادات حزب الإصلاح في المديرية هذا مثال واحد على 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 هذا الشخص، استغلال حزب الاصلاح للارهابيين استمر بشكل كبير جدا حتى اقسم من السلطه بسبب خلافات مع حزب المؤتمر و لكن هنا نشات النواه للارهاب، شهدنا بعد ذلك مجموعه من المجاهدين الذين شاركوا في 94 او من يسمون انفسهم بالمجاهدين يقومون باغتيال سته من السياح على جانب بينهم اسبان وبريطانيين وامريكيين في 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 محافظه ابين على راسهم كان المحضار الذي اعدم بعد ذلك في عام 1999 او قيل انه اعدم. هؤلاء جميعا كانوا من المشاركين في حرب 94 من من جلدوا من افغانستان للمشاركه في حرب 94 طبعا لدينا قوائم ولدينا لقاءات صحفيه مع هؤلاء من المصريين ومن جنسيات اخرى اعترفوا ان النظام انذاك اعطاهم رتب عسكريه مقابل المشاركه في حرب 94 وكانوا يستلمون رواتب من النظام حتى ما قبل سنوات قليله حتى سقوط النظام في عام 2011. بعد ذلك استغل حزب الاصلاح سيطرته على وزاره التربيه، قام بتغيير المناهج، قام بتغيير حتى اسماء المدارس باسماء اسلاميه، انا كنت ادرس في مدرسه ثانويه اسمها مدرسه ابو عشير وهو يعني يعتبر بطل من ابطال النضال القومي في اليمن الجنوبي، تم تغييرها باسم مدرسه الحمزه. تم تغيير اسماء المدارس والشوارع وكل المعالم في الجنوب باسماء اسلاميه على يد حزب الاصلاح. لكن ليس هذا الاخطر، الاخطر تغيير كان المناهج الدراسيه وتعبئتها بانتقاء شديد بالايات والاحاديث التي تعبئ الاطفال بالكراهيه ضد الاخر، ضد امريكا، ضد المختلف، ضد المسيحيين، ضد اليهود، ضد الجميع. هذا الامر ساعد ساعد على نشاه جيل نراه اليوم يعني ينتمي الى الجماعات الارهابيه داعش والقاعده والحوثيين وكثير من الجماعات الارهابيه الاخرى. استمر الامر على هذا المنوال حتى وصلنا الى المشاكل التي وصلنا اليها واستخدم ايضا هذا الخطاب وهذه المجامع ضد الحراك الجنوبي في عام 2007 عندما نشا الحراك الجنوبي وصدرت فتاوى التكفير هناك نقطه لا اذكرها كان هناك فتوى رسمية من حزب الإصلاح في عام 1994 وهي مسجلة في التلفزيون الرسمي أو في الإذاعة الرسمية في صنعاء أنه يجوز وهذه على اللسان عبد الوهاب الدينمي أحد منظري الفكر الإخواني في اليمن وأحد قادة حزب الإصلاح قال أنه يجوز قتل الجنوبيين جميعا من أجل الوحدة ومن أجل ألا تسقط راية الإسلام يعني اعتبر عدم قتل الجنوبيين اسقاط لرايه الاسلام واباح دماء الجنوبيين، في عام 2007 تجددت هذه الامور وكان الجنود يقتلون الناس في الشوارع في المظاهرات مسلحين بهذه الفتوى، هو يعتقد انه يقتل هؤلاء الجنوبيين لانهم كفار مشركين بسبب فتوى لم تبطلها حتى قيادات حزب الاصلاح حتى اليوم، شهدنا قبل ايام بل قبل اسبوع تقريبا فتوى مماثله مما يسمى بعلماء اليمن، نفس الاشخاص، نفس الوجوه كفروا المجلس الانتقالي الجنوبي والقوات الجنوبيه التي تكافح الارهاب في 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 شرق وجنوب اليمن وفي مناطق اخرى. 
بعد ذلك استخدم الدين مره اخرى ضد الحراك الجنوبي يستخدم اليوم ضد المجلس الانتقالي آه الان نحن نواجه مشكله مركبه نحن نواجه ارهاب سني وارهاب شيعي لدينا ارهاب آه في صنعاء وفي المناطق التي يسيطر عليها الحوثيون وهذه مساله خطيره جدا يحاول الحوثيون خلال الفتره الاخيره تعبئه الاطفال بفكر طائفي شديد الكراهيه نحو الاخر السني المختلف معه أقام الحوثيون خلال العطلة الصيفية التي انتهت قبل أسابيع مراكز صيفية استوعبت 300 ألف طفل في المناطق التي يسيطر عليها آه تم تعبئتهم بفكر طائفي آه كراهية شديدة لل... لل... للسعودية وللدول المحيطة ولدول الخليج وللمناطق الأخرى داخل اليمن التي لا تنتمي إلى هذا الفكر تم تدريبهم على السلاح وعلى القتل وعلى ما يسمونه بمقاومة العدوان بمعنى أننا نتعرض الآن لتفخيخ للمستقبل اليمن لم يكن عبر تاريخ يعاني من مشكلة طائفية يحاول الحوثيون الآن إضافة مشكلة جديدة ستكون يعني كانت هي على المستقبل هي مشكلة طائفية بالإضافة إلى المشاكل الكبيرة التي أنشأتها جماعة من فلسطة الإصلاح وجماعة سياسية مختلفة وهذا أمر خطير جدا إذا نحن أمام تيارين من الإرهاب، التيار الأول مستمد من فكر الإخوان المسلمين ومن فكر حسن البنا الذي عاد عبر مجموعة من الطلبة أصبحوا مشايخ فيما بعد من مصر، أيضا نحن أمام فكر إرهابي آخر بدأ يجتاح كثير من المناطق، فكر مرتبط بثورة الخميني، ما يسمى في إيران بالثورة الإسلامية. لم يعرف الوطن العربي يعني القتال الطائفي خلال العصر الحديث الا بعد قيام ثوره الخميني التي بدات بتمويل جماعات في لبنان وفي العراق ومن ثم الان ما نشهده في اليمن، نحن نشهد في اليمن هذه الحرب التي نشهدها على يد الحوثيين وقتل عشرات الالاف على يد الحوثيين نتيجه مباشره للدعم الايراني ولانشاء هذه الجماعات، هذه الجماعه الحوثيه عباره عن مجموعه تدربوا في ايران منذ منذ بداية الثمانينات وعادوا لشان هذه الحرب التي نشهدها. إذا الفكر الإرهابي جاء من طريقين مختلفين. كلاهما الآن يهددان المجتمع اليمني ويهددان المنطقة والعالم. نحن أمام تعبئة من طرفين، من قبل الإخوان المسلمين في طرف ومن قبل الحوثيين في طرف آخر. وهذه التعبئة الإرهابية تطال حتى الأطفال والنساء كما ذكرت الدكتورة. آه الان في في سمعتم ربما عن المشاكل الاحداث الاخيره التي حصلت في عدن وابين ومناطق اخرى حاولت من خلالها يعني حزب الاصلاح والحوثيون آه بتعاون من الحوثيين السيطره على الجنوب مره اخرى واخضاعه مره اخرى آه استخدمت للاسف الحكومه ما تسمى بالحكومه الشرعيه مجاميع ارهابيه وهذه ليست بالدعايه أنا يمكنني أن أذكر أسماء هنا يمكن أن تدخلوا على مواقع الإنترنت وتجدوها مطلوبة حتى لهذه الدولية، أذكر على سبيل المثال الخضر قديف. الخضر قديف هذا الرجل الأول في وزارة الداخلية اليمنية، هو قائد حراسة وزير الداخلية ومساعده الأول والمتحكم بالوزارة. هذا الرجل مطلوب منذ عام 2008 حتى للأمن في اليمن. وللدول الخارجية باعتباره كان قائدا لجماعة القاعدة في أبين في فترة ما واعترفت وزارة الداخلية في رد على بعض الصحفيين واتهمتني أنا شخصيا بأني أثرت هذا الموضوع وقالت ويمكنكم أن تدخلوا على موقع وزارة الداخلية لا زال موجود هذا الرد قالت أن هذا الشخص كان كادرا في الجماعات الجهادية أن وزارة الداخلية تصف الجماعات الإرهابية والجماعات الجهادية وهذا عند معظم الناس في مستوى التعليم المعروف يعتبر مدح ربما لهذه الجماعات قالت أن هذا كان كادر كادر ولاحظوا المصطلحات التي استخدمها في الجماعات الجهادية لكنه تركها عام 2008 وأصبح مواطنا وقياديا كبيرا في وزارة الداخلية هذا اعتراف رسمي من وزارة الداخلية اليمنية باستخدام هذه المجاميع ومع أن هذا الشخص عندما تقول عندما قالت انه ترك الجماعات الارهابيه في 2008 قاد هجوما للارهابيين عام 2012 على مديريه لودر في ابيان 
قتل على اثره اكثر من 300 مواطن مدني وقامت بالمناسبه على اثر ذلك حرب شعبيه قادها ابناء ابين وابناء لودر على وجه الخصوص يعني انا اعتبرها اول حرب شعبيه غير مموله من اي طرف ضد الارهاب يعني على التاريخ ونشات الجزائر الشعبيه بعد ذلك التي قاومت الارهاب ناتي الى مرحله معينه في عام 2015 اذا كان يسمح الوقت اوكي يو اوكي؟ يس يو فينيش هناك الكثير طبعا ولكن الوقت لم يسعفنا شكرا للاستماع دكتور اوكي ويل ايف اول جست تيرن اوفر كويستشن تايم تو بيبول ام بيرين ان مايند وي هاف 10 minutes so we'll take a couple of questions a number of questions and i'll leave it open to the speakers we'll take the lady there we'll take the gentleman there and the gentleman there. Uh, thank you so much for all of you very important uh, events today because it's related to terrorism on terrorism uh, i will talk in arabic because it's easier for me to express the situation in Yemen. Uh, very much. The gentleman there, please. يضرب الارهاب ومن 
يعطي غطاء اعلامي للارهاب ويصدر الارهابيين في قنواتهم المشبوهه شكرا Thank you very much. Um, if I can ask the questions, that the questions be very concise so we can give the chance to the speakers to be able to speak because we now have five minutes left. I take the gentleman and then I will hand over, if possible, to the speakers at least to round off and if there's really one or two minutes left, then we can ask. So please keep it short. Dr. Mohammed and Director of the Arab Center for Justice, for Justice in UK. Uh, my question to uh, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. You are a very big uh, hero to visit Yemen uh, and of the war. Anyway, uh, and you said about the uh, peace deal. I agree with you. But do you think we need uh, a new program for the transitional justice in Yemen, like human rights, like reconciliation? Uh, this is my question. And uh, the other question to Mr. Salah, I'm going to talk to you about the problem that I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you about the Arabic language when it was destroyed after the Arab people after the war in Afghanistan, and it did not destroy the Arab people in the Arab community. تمنح هؤلاء الابتعاد عن الافكار الايديولوجيه التي كانوا يحملونها وقاتلوا من اجلها في افغانستان شكرا جزيلا may i just ask the speakers really to be very very brief um, because the other people who are to take over here for the next session i'm really sorry that we can't take any more questions, but I wish to allow the speakers to be very short and brief in their response, please. <coughs> so, if I can ask Dr. Kendall. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry there wasn't more time to hear comments. So, clearly, people are very passionate, and I understand why passions are aroused by this. There's only one comment I need to make. Yes, of course, it would take days to talk properly about terrorism problem in the Middle East, but we only have 20 minutes each, unfortunately. Dr. Mohammed, I believe we should have transitional justice. I think this is necessary, and I think that it's one of the reasons we're in the terrible situation, one of many reasons we're in the terrible situation we are now in Yemen, is that when Ali Abdullah Saleh was ousted from power, there was no transitional justice, and perhaps there should have been. I think this is required, not just for now, but for future generations. People need to understand that actions have consequences. Mr. Salah. <laughs> أعداد منهم كبيرة مش بس لم يتم إدماجهم وعيد استخدامهم في حرب أخرى يسموها في الجهاد نحن نعاني من تبعاتها حتى الآن So thank you everyone for your participation maybe if you, you may wish to speak after outside with our two speakers and extend your, your comments further thank you very much